Thanks. And welcome to part two of Canary Live Seattle. All right. Um, so part two of our event tonight, we are very excited to bring you a uh, live recording of the Volts podcast. If you're not already a listener and a fan of Volts, you should be. It's run by David Roberts, a longtime friend and colleague of mine and a fellow Seattleite um, and an editor at large at Canary Media. Um, so David is great at having in-depth conversations with all sorts of interesting people pushing the clean energy transition forward. And tonight he has an excellent guest, um, Ramez Nam, who he'll tell you more about, another fellow Seattleite. We're really excited for this conversation. Um, so uh, please, a big round of applause for David and Mez. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I just wanted to say, um, before we started, I, I should have thought in advance how to say this delicately. A lot of us have been to a lot of energy events, a lot of us old, old hands, and um, especially in the early years, we got very accustomed to seeing seas of gray hair uh, <laughs> at said events. And so it's just such a thrill that things have come as far as they have, and this room is full of exciting young people doing cool stuff. Woo! Yeah. Makes me feel old, but it's a small price to pay. Are you saying that we're old now? <laughs> yes, I'm afraid, yeah, if you do the math. Uh, so, um, also, this is being uh, recorded for my podcast. This will be an episode of Volts, so maybe everybody in the room say hi to Volts listeners at home. Hi, Volts. You could have been here, but you were too lazy. Um, okay, I'm joined today by R Ramez Nam, who is a longtime energy guru, I guess it would be the word, forecaster, uh, VC guy now, author of books on climate change and sci-fi books and other books, speaker, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody I have been uh, looking to for wisdom since I started this back in the, in the dark ages. So uh, I'm excited to talk just about sort of uh, where things are now that we've been in this game for 20 years and how uh, things have changed and sort of what's, what's next. So I wanted to start um, the way Mez came to my attention and I think a lot of people's attention uh, in this world was a 2011 <laughs> blog post um, in which uh, <clears throat> Mez said, here's the rate at which solar is getting cheaper. I'm going to make the bold prediction that it is going to continue doing that, which you'd think wouldn't be that revolutionary uh, 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 of a thing to do, but you know, anybody who knows energy forecasts knows that as long as there has been solar, there have been people forecasting that it's going to stop getting cheaper, that it's going to level out, it's going to plateau. If you look at the forecast, it's just plateau, 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 and the reality is just down, down, down. And Mez just said, yeah, it's going to go down. And if you just project ahead on existing learning curves, you get what look like ludicrously optimistic <laughs> Uh, projections, which you then uh, updated in 2015 and then updated again in 2020, and both times found that despite having been decried for ludicrous optimism, prices had in fact fallen farther than your, <laughs> your uh, forecast. And you did a, a similar post on, on batteries, more or less with the same structure. So I guess the way, since I think we all, I think we agree that solar, wind, and batteries are gonna be the core of the electrify everything uh, 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 century. Um, I guess my first question is just, do you think solar is going to keep doing that? Yeah, well so first David, it's awesome to be here. We've known each other for 
those you know, 13, 12 years now, and we met basically on Twitter uh, <laughs> arguing about this stuff back then. So yeah, in 2011, I wrote a piece for Scientific American, a blog post, and at the time, the IEA, National Energy Agency, uh, had a forecast for solar costs that the cost of solar electricity would drop uh, by about in a half from 2010 to 2050. And my, <laughs> and my forecast was very naive. Like, I'm, I'm not that smart. I was very lucky. I came from tech, where we have Moore's Law, and they just applied the very same sort of very dumb learning model to solar. And because I didn't know enough about energy to like, know how I was going to be wrong, I just, it worked, more or less. <laughs> so my forecast was the cost of solar would drop by about a factor of 10 to 2050. And it actually dropped twice as fast as I thought it would. And again, like, I just, there were various things wrong in that model. And I've updated them since and like, found where the errors are, I think. Will it keep getting cheap? Like, the future is uncertain. But the odds are yes. So my personal forecast is the cost of solar electricity will drop by another factor of four uh, by the time electricity is, by the time solar is about a third of all uh, electricity generation on Earth. Something like that. Now, could it be twice as fast? Maybe. That's pushing it. Could it be half that rate? Yeah. But it, it's already at the point. So I, I think of it as clean electricity, especially solar, and now batteries have gone through. They're entering their third phase. The first phase was all of history from the 1970s to 2010, 2015, they were in their first phase that was uh, totally uncompetitive, totally policy dependent. Then with a, a second phase where new electricity from solar and wind became cheaper in some parts of the world than building new power from gas and coal, at least during the hours the sun shone or that the wind did. Um, and that's their second phase, cost competitive. And now they're into their third phase. And we've seen this like next era started saying this in 2018, 2019, that they hit this phase where the cost just on a pure kilowatt hour basis of electricity from new solar, new wind would be cheaper than the operational cost of an already built coal or gas power plant. And that is, that's happening. That happened in Indiana. It's happened in Texas. Like it's, again, it doesn't, doesn't deal with like intermittency and what you do when the sun goes down and so on, but it's on a bulk electricity basis. And there's every reason to believe this will continue. Now, solar is the fastest of these technologies. Batteries are nearly the same pace. Wind is like half the pace, and wind has various problems. It just doesn't scale as fast. Hydrogen electrolyzers are going to look like batteries, I think. Um, batteries and EVs, EVs are still in their first phase. They're still more expensive than gasoline cars, but they are plunging in price and growing in scale at twice the pace of solar. So I, I do think there's lots of reasons, not in every single clean tech, but in those, and the ones we make in factories, mass produce in high volumes, uh, simple, single part uh, items if you can, that those will have a very, very rapid learning rate uh, for decades to come. Good stuff. Um, so one of the, <laughs> one of the questions, um, you know, one of the big questions about um, the electrify everything model uh, is wind and solar variable. Even with batteries, the batteries we have today, you can get two, four, maybe six, eight hours out of lithium ion batteries, but you still have variability to deal with. And so there's this idea that sort of, you're gonna get to, depending on who you ask, 60, 70, 80, 90%, and you're gonna have to fill in the remainder with something else. And it seems to me whether that's 60% or 90% depends a lot on just how cheap solar and wind get. So I guess, I'm, I, I guess what I'd like to ask is how far do you think Electrify Everything is gonna go? Do you think these learning curves are gonna be so far and so fast that we're gonna end up needing less of that supplemental stuff than is currently forecast? Yeah, I think it, it varies on a variety of things. It varies on geography. So for instance, Europe is harder to power with renewables than the US is, because the US has more sunshine and solar gets cheap the fastest. Europe has like the high, Europe or Japan or Taiwan or South Korea are these places that have winter peaking systems and don't have a lot of sun. So they're more dependent on wind, doesn't get cheap as fast. Uh, it also matters how big the grid is. Like if we built a Chinese scale grid in the US, you could have solar going from New Mexico to New York. You could have wind from the Great Plains going out to the coast. But if we don't get transmission built, and right now we're sucking at building transmission in the US, then like powering New York in winter is actually really hard. Uh, so those are like big variables. And in general, I have my opinions on what I think is gonna get cheap the fastest, but I'm in general a believer in like, let's have more tools in the toolkit than we think we need, 
because some of them are not going to pan out in certain areas. So let's invest in all of it. Let's invest in small modular reactor, nuclear, nuclear fusion, uh, transmission grids, ultra long duration energy storage, power to hydrogen. Let's do all of it and like be in a situation where we have more tools than we need rather than fewer. All right, you're doing the, the all all the above cop out, so I'm going to put you on this. <laughs> <laughs> so you have. So solar, wind, and battery, you have your, your, you have your variable core, and yep. then you have your the supplements to even out the power, smooth out the power. Yeah. Right now, what's going to occupy that role, yeah. that supplemental role, is up in the air. Could be, yeah. um, it could be a lot more storage. It could be, as you say, a lot more transmission. Yeah. It could be some sort of clean, firm yeah. power, like uh, geothermal or uh, small nukes, it could be small natural gas plants with CCS, which yeah. is what you see in the models, in the Net big models, absorbed. they yeah. have truckloads of, of natural gas with CCS, all playing the same basic role, which is evening out the variability of renewable energy. So I, I want to know, yes, we want to invest in everything, yes, we want to pursue everything, yeah. yes, we want to keep our options open, but in your opinion, so what is the mix that's going to play that role? The most underrated of those technologies is super long duration transmission. That is probably the one that we long don't Long distance, you mean? Ultra long distance, like coast to coast, continent scale transmission. It's probably the one that has the best upside and the most certainty that we can do it, but it's blocked not by economics, not by technology, but by permitting, fundamentally, and we're not doing a lot of, on there. I think um, clean firm, whether you call it nuclear vision, SMR vision, Fusion, geothermal everywhere, you know, ultra deep geothermal can get power any place on the earth, uh, has a big role to play. Ultra long duration storage is a wild card. Like 12 hour storage, I'm convinced, is like, that's going to be solved. But in Europe uh, or on the US East Coast, you need weeks or months of storage. Right. And we don't, like, there's a few technologies that might do that, but they're wild cards right now. Um, I think offshore wind has a huge role to play, and floating offshore wind is one of the most underrated technologies because in deep water, you basically can't do bottom mount uh, offshore wind. So around Japan or the US West Coast, I think floating offshore wind is probably also a massively underrated technology. And then my, my very favorite total wild card in these that nobody believes in really but me is, uh, is space-based solar. I knew it. And that one, that made, I, my friend Greg Maniac's been talking about space-based solar for a decade. And I'd be like, no, 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 Greg. 20% of the Earth's land area is desert. I, Space launch costs so much. Why would we ever do this? But in space, there's no clouds. Uh, you can just have it. You can get 24-7 power. You can beam it to Earth with microwaves that penetrate clouds and rain. Uh, and some models show it getting in at like two or three cents a kilowatt hour based on things like how, how cheap Starship is going to make launch cost, we think. Right. And isn't space is getting cheaper, right? Getting up to space is space launch, rapidly getting cheaper. Space launch is getting cheaper faster than solar. Um, mm. only, only two things in history have gotten cheap faster than solar to date, which are computing uh, and gene sequencing or gene printing. But right now, we're going to phase where the cost of space launch is actually dropping faster than the cost of solar. And so that, and then you have this other advantage, you beam power back to Earth in microwaves. There's a variety of challenges of it, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, but if you, if you beam it down to the same intensity as sunlight, where antennas are like three or four times as efficient, so you get four times the power per the same land area, and it works in winter. So that's, that's my personal wild card. I'm, there's only like, there's like six startups in the whole world doing it. But I'm, I'm actually has, looking. There been, has there been solar power transmitted to Earth from space? Like, has it, no. uh, has it, has it actually no. happened? <laughs> no, and there's, there's various problems with it. So we, we've had the first experiments of transmitting, and we have lots of solar in space for satellites. And we have the first experiments happening for transmitting solar from one satellite to another. Uh, but the big problem, so some startups are using lasers. Lasers are BS, because lasers don't penetrate clouds and rain, so why would you do it? It doesn't matter. But one of them just raised a bunch of money, whatever. Uh, the way to actually do it is microwaves. But the, the problem with microwaves is if you want to hit a target on Earth, you need these kilometer square arrays in space, and no one's ever built anything of that size in space. So it's, if you want sci-fi, and I want some sci-fi. And do you that's fry totally the birds? Sci-fi. Do you fry the birds? You can transmit it. I mean, you could if you're really if you're really good. If you wanted to. No one can get that good. No one can get that good at beaming <laughs> microwaves yet. Um, but you could transmit it at like one sunlight intensity, but get three or four times the energy on the ground in the same area. So you it, like getting to where you can fry birds is actually a really really hard problem. <laughs> it's not the problem that we have right now. Interesting, interesting. And this brings up my, 
my lonely wild card, since yeah. you were talking about lonely wild cards, the one that only I seem to care about, which is wireless charging of electrical devices, which I always, which I always thought conceptually solves all kinds of problems. I can just imagine, you know, power transmitters seeded throughout your city and every electrical device having a, a receiver able to receive power through the air. I mean, these, those technologies ex exist. Like yeah. you can power something at a distance. Now, even at a reasonably large distance, there are like sonar versions, laser versions, there's X-ray, weird X-ray versions. And I just thought like, cut the cord, all, this, all these charging difficulties go away. Basically everything electrical is charging all the time. When I, when I do my little, you know, the future meme, you know, the future world we're gonna have meme, like it's all wireless charging. Do you have an eye on that? Is anything happening there? Do you, do you think that's gonna go anywhere? I have a little bit of an eye on that, but it, doesn't, it still doesn't solve a lot of the problems because it's really hard to do super long distance. Again, unless you build these, if you wanna penetrate clouds anyway, unless you build these kilometer square transmitters. Uh, so I think for a short range, like within our room, um, either there are potential, or maybe for like mountaintop to mountaintop, but getting it you know, across a continent without bouncing it in space is really hard, I think. All right, and you are in tech, really, and not really in politics, but I'm curious what your take is on, you know, the, I wouldn't say that IRA has taken care of the funding problem. I mean, I think we still need a lot more funding for everything all the time, everywhere. But, but there's a huge accelerant now, at least in terms yeah. of money. So what do you see then when you think about the US um, decarbonizing? Yeah. What are the big remaining barriers that worry you? It's a really good question. I'd say like the IRA is just part of the puzzle. Like the IRA, it's interesting, the IRA is understated. It's not $450 billion of federal spending a year. It's like trillions. Because the IRA is not a pool of money. It's a per unit subsidy. And forecasters always do what on unit forecasts? They always underestimate it, right? So the actual size of the IRA is actually much larger. And at the same I think time, Goldman, just, Goldman Sachs said 1.3 trillion, I think, was its number, as opposed to the official number, which was 3.9. Billion. 300 and some billion or 40 yeah, billion. Yeah, 300 and something billion, um, but a lot more than the official forecast. Yeah, and I'd say the IRA also, like, we, we talk a lot about the U.S., but let's think about this globally. Like, three big things happened in global climate policy over the last few years. China has further put uh, its foot on the accelerator. India's done some, but I don't count that. Vladimir Putin invading Ukraine. Putin is like now a climate hero. I mean, he's an asshole, <laughs> but, he's, but he's, he's done all this work because we thought natural gas was going to be the last fossil fuel we got off of, and Putin thought, you know, the natural gas exports to Europe, he had Europe over a barrel. But instead, he's accelerated the pace which Europe is getting off of gas, deploying more renewables, ultra-long ultra duration storage, hydrogen, funding fusion, all this stuff. So those are equally big, and the IRA is really big. What is the IRA uh, not, and by, oh, by the way, in the U.S., we talk about the IRA, we don't talk enough about state-level policies. 29 states in the U.S have a binding RPS or CES, right? And that's, that's sort of before the IRA and it's actually potentially even, even more impactful. Uh, what does the IRA not solve? It doesn't solve permitting. And that's actually like the Achilles heel that we have. And when we talk about permitting, like it, there's a strain of environmentalism that is like, don't build it environmentalism and that's gonna kill us. Like that's the, the biggest political barrier we have in the US is that it's so dang hard to build things. And if you talk about NEPA reform, whatever, NEPA is just the feds. Like if you wanna build something, it's this inter-nested uh, issue of multiple federal agencies and then multiple states and then county level and city level and every property owner. We just had the first interstate transmission line in the US, the biggest one, approved like two months ago, I think, Arizona to California. Yeah, I think it's an $8 billion project. Okay, that's, I mean, we need to spend trillions, right? Uh, that $8 billion project took 18 years to get approval from multiple states, uh, multiple counties, landowners, and so on. If that's the pace, we're just in a world of hurt. So what do I think? The most important thing we can do in policy in the U.S. is get out of the way and allow stuff to be built. NIMBY is like the, the death of the world if we don't stop it. Yeah, <laughs> this is going to be a, this is going to be an interesting 
uh, internecine tension, I think. That's, there's, a great, there's a great article in Heat Map about it just uh, this week. Everybody should be reading Heat Map. It was about this, and I wrote, <clears throat> not to. Eric has an opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> After you're done with Canary, you should read, uh, you should read Heat Map. Uh, and I, not to toot my own horn, but I wrote about this back in 2012 or whatever, but this distinction between climate hawks and environmentalists is how I put it. People who are primarily focused on decarbonization, people who are primarily coming out of the environmental movement with all its sort of associated commitments and, and, and whatnot. And I think this is gonna be a huge tension, but it's also, do you worry at all? Maybe you don't worry, I worry about a lot of the people who are <clears throat> yelling about permitting are, want to cut down environmental review because they don't care about the environment and want more oil and gas and don't, you, you know, this is, just, this is all bad faith from one large portion of this debate. Do you worry about being on the same side with a bunch of bad faith Jerk offs. I think the bad faith, the bad faith actors, the actors that want like permitting reforms so they can build more fossil fuels, are on the losing side of history. They're just they're betting on a technology that fundamentally is going to lose on cost. So I say let it come. Like in an open playing field, if it's easier to build pipelines and transmission lines, clean electricity is going to win. So I'm totally happy taking that deal. You know, Bernie Sanders disagrees, right? Like he he voted against the Schumer Mansion permitting reform bill that you had one Republican vote for uh, because he's so obsessed, as the environment is obsessed with don't build fossil fuels. Well, guess what? Building more renewables is actually more important than not building fossil fuel on a, on a competitive basis, this is at least my bet, the clean energy just wins on cost. So like open the floodgates, let it in, and clean energy is gonna win, is my well, personal well, viewpoint on this. What do you make of, of this, um, you know, this just came out another version of, of, of information that's come out over and over again over the years, which just shows that fossil fuels are not declining. Globally, they're not declining. We are adding on to the total energy load of the world. That's what renewables are doing, is increasing the total, but the actual amount of fossil fuels is not declining, which leads yeah. a lot of people to say, building new renewables is not enough. We have to cut off supply at some point. What do you make of that? argument. So I think you've got, to, you've got to look at leading indicators and trailing indicators. And the leading indicator is cost. What's going to win economically? And then the second, you know, the next indicator, this, the like, next derivative is like pace of deployment increase and then actual deployment and like actual like deployed stocks is a super trailing indicator. So you look at, you look at this and uh, are we growing uh, renewables fast enough now? Are they undoing uh, fossil fuels? Well, actually, we might have passed peak fossil fuels in the power sector in 2022. Uh, all the growth, we have not yet shrunk the internal combustion engine car fleet, but what was the, anybody want to guess, like what's the year in which we sell more, uh, sorry, in which sales of gasoline powered cars peaks? Anybody have a guess? 2017, 2018, it happened already. Now we wanted to go down faster, we want uh, retirements of ICEs cars to be faster than deployments, but all the growth in vehicles and passenger vehicles is electric. So have we peaked yet? No, and I think we'll have peak total fossil fuels and peak emissions sometime later in this decade, uh, towards 2030. It's not fast enough, uh, but we like, the writing is on the wall. Like fossil fuels are, are primarily dead men walking. It's just a matter of how fast can we pull it off. Interesting. So let's talk. The... I I'm very opinionated here, but that's like, <laughs> that's just what the math says. <laughs> so let's talk then about, about uh, the hard to abate sectors then, because they're the ones, you know, I think we can, I wouldn't say we have electricity in hand, but we have a, we have a, a sight line to where we're going yeah. on electricity. We have a sight line where we're going on transportation. We have I'm a grounded. sight line in buildings, although this crowd is full of people who will tell us all about the many complications of, of doing what we know how to do in buildings, but we know how to do what we need to do in buildings. But there are, um, these legendary, difficult to decarbonize sectors. So two questions, one is, do you think they're still, do you think they still warrant that term? Do you think they're still difficult to decarbonize? And, uh, and which of those worry you? Yeah, they are. And so I, I should say that what I've been saying is mostly related to power and ground transport. That's where we have really, really fast linear rates. Um, 
But if you add up ground transport and power, you've got maybe 45% of global carbon emissions, right? The other, the really big ones are industrial emissions. Or who talked about cement? Uh, my math is more like six, seven percent of emissions. Steel is another seven or eight. But like industrial emissions are really hard, uh, and it's not clear that the learning rates will be as fast as our renewables. So that is a big problem. That said, like I wrote a piece for TechCrunch in 2018 or something where I was really worried about this, and we've made more progress faster on industrial emissions than I expected those four or five years ago. So are we going to go fast enough? I don't know, but we're, we're moving the, that, that needle. And then the other one that, that's hard and big, we talk about aviation, steel is four times as big as aviation, right? Like aviation we will solve eventually, but steel and cement are really big ones. But the other one that's really hard is agriculture, forestry, and land use. Ca cows and deforestation. Mm -hmm. And that one's not growing, really, but it's about a quarter of all emissions. It's bigger than industrial emissions. It rivals electricity, um, and that's going to take a mix of just pure policy work to protect land uh, and finding a way to feed the world's appetite for meat, which is just gonna go up. Like forget about reducing meat consumption. It ain't gonna happen. Meat consumption is gonna keep going like this and this. So we've gotta find ways to produce that meat or something that people think is meat at a way that, that's cost, comp and I, I'm actually not that bullish on alternative proteins either. I think it's gotta be like, mostly it's gonna be fields, like where we grow corn and, and soy and so on today and wheat and, and ha animal agriculture is my guess, we've got to find a way with a, a cost perspective to reduce that cost, to reduce the emissions, reduce emissions of things like fertilizer, that might be six or seven percent of emissions, and protect land from being converted from forest or wetlands uh, into, uh, into crops uh, or grazing land. And that one, that one, cows and steel and cement keep me up more than electricity and uh, cars. So what, what is happening in steel? Like you say we're making more progress than you thought. What is the, what is the, the solution that you? Yeah, I mean, I think with steel, the most likely solution um, is power to hydrogen. Uh, like a lot of the steel emissions, so for recycled steel, increasingly we use electric arc furnaces, you can power them with renewables. Uh, but for primary steel, we use coal as a reducing agent. Iron ore has oxygen on it. You've got to strip the oxygen off. So we're using the coal you can bust the coal, you get carbon monoxide, it binds with the oxygen and strips it off. It's a reducing agent. So you can use hydrogen for that, and hydrogen does look like it's gonna have a, a sharp reduction. It's not the only bet. There's other bets, I think, uh, Breakthrough invested in a company that does a form of uh, electrolysis to extract uh, pig iron, or uh, sorry, iron, pure iron ore from, uh, or pure iron that you can use to make steel from iron ore. So there are multiple technology pathways in each of these, uh, but right now hydrogen looks like the best bet, I'd say, for steel. Well, let's talk about hydrogen for a second then, because this is like, uh, as Amy said earlier, everybody, hydrogen is on everybody's, tip of everybody's tongue. It's the, it's the <clears throat> next uh, uh, bell of the ball. Everyone loves it. Everyone thinks it's gonna do everything. And you can, technically, do everything with it <laughs> if, you, yeah. if you wanted to. So how, you know, this, this gets back a little to one of my original questions, which is how far electrification is going to go and how much you're going to need other stuff. Yeah. Where's, what role, how big of a role do you see hydrogen playing in the final analysis? Hydrogen could be enormous. It could be that we build as much power gen, as much renewables to produce green hydrogen as we do for direct power uh, into, you know, buildings and electric vehicles and so on. Uh, we'll see. I think there's things that where hydrogen is not the solution. As I mentioned earlier, like hydrogen-powered cars and trucks, forget about it. That's been clear for a decade. That's not going to be cost-competitive electrification. Um, you saw the Toyota guy now. Like, oh, Toyota is like, guy. so out to lunch. Like, they're, they're so good on, on hybrids, and they just like, totally missed the boat on electrification. He's out, he's out now doing sort of the like uh, falling on his sword thing, apologizing oh, to good. everyone. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's clear. It's a little late. For anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about, the Toyota's, it was one executive, I think it was like the le legendary longtime head of Toyota was like, electricity, ish electricity, it's going to be hydrogen fuel cells and just clung to that and some well those, after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was a uniquely so. Japanese thing. Like Japan as a country has made some interesting you know, on paper, bets on hydrogen that just don't make any sense. Importing hydrogen across oceans is just, is, hydrogen's so hard to move. It's like Mixing hydrogen into your natural gas in your natural gas pipelines? Yeah, that might work for just distribution of the hydrogen 
you know, hydrogen, like pipelines are the only cheap way we know of to move hydrogen today. Or using the hydrogen to make steel, for instance, that you then ship around the world. Um, but hydrogen for like building heat doesn't make any sense. Hydrogen for cars doesn't make any sense. But hydrogen makes a ton of sense uh, for steel making, maybe for high temperature industrial heat. Uh, hydrogen makes a ton of sense as an ingredient to make electrofuels you can put in existing ships and planes, whether that's ammonia or a drop in kerosene. Uh, we'll probably never make hydrogen powered planes, they don't make any sense, but making uh, a drop in fuel from hydrogen that you can burn in existing Boeings and Airbuses uh, does potentially make sense. So it has, and hydrogen for green fertilizer. Uh, fertilizer is already like, I don't know, 70, 80 billion dollar market for hydrogen uh, goes into, you know, methane based hydrogen for fertilizer around the world today. So that's already like an enormous uh, market that once hydrogen gets cheap enough, it has various access to. Yeah, everybody should listen to the pod I just released this morning, I think. I'm not sure when this will come out, so this won't mean anything to listeners, but my last pod, a guy whose business model is off-grid renewables feeding directly into electrolyzers, making green hydrogen, which then go electri directly into methanol. They're starting with methanol for ships. None yeah. of it's connected to the grid, no pipelines coming in or out. The only thing that comes out of the whole thing is trucks full of methanol. It's a really interesting It makes area. a ton of sense. It's way easier to move hydrogen as a product that's not hydrogen than as hydrogen right, itself. Right, right, right. That was his calculation. His calculation was it's really difficult to move hydrogen, and it's really difficult these days to move electricity. Yeah. So let's move the methanol. Yeah. Let's make methanol and move it. I will say was that the policy details about hydrogen were mentioned in the earlier panel, and there's a big policy fight right now of what's, what gets counted as clean electricity for hydrogen, and there's every chance we're going to screw it up, and the IRA is going to be <laughs> You know, interpreted by Treasury that actually controls who gets the tax credit to just let you like buy grid electricity and unbundle directs, which are kind of BS, uh, as a way to call your hydrogen green. And if that's the case, it's going to set us back for a while. And we, like, we'll see how Treasury rules, uh, but it's not looking that pretty. Although it's worth saying that it says, not to get into this whole thing, but it says, it says in the statute that the hydrogen subsidies must reduce emissions. So yep. if they do it that way, it won't reduce emissions. So I don't see how they get around that very plain statutory language, although I'm sure if they tried hard I'd, enough. I'd love to be wrong. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that you're right. And another big battle going on around hydrogen that's maybe just worth calling out is, is natural gas companies that are dying, looking at obsolescence, flailing about for some reason to stay alive are now talking about mixing hydrogen in yeah. with natural gas to lower the greenhouse gas intensity of the yeah. natural gas, which is just, somebody, somebody compared it to pouring champagne in your municipal water supply or, uh, or, or something like that, just the most ludicrous use of, of hydrogen possible. But that's a, there's a lot of money, a yeah. lot of money behind that one now. So hydrogen, a lot of opportunities for shenanigans around hydrogen. Um, I want to ask a, a bigger theoretical question because this is one of the <clears throat> one of my favorite things to talk about, and I'm never sure how seriously I take it. <laughs> I'm never sure how serious I am about it. But um, when you look forward at the solar cost curve, you know it was ludicrously optimistic back in 2011. If you just do the same thing today, once again, it, like 10 years out, it's just ludicrously cheap. It's just cheap beyond anything anybody knows how to process yeah. today. Uh, you know, wind too and batteries too, but mainly solar. And so, you know, as, you know, you had a great uh, chart about batteries, which just made the point that like, as they get cheaper, you find more uses for them. And as you find more uses for them, they build more and they scale up and they get cheaper, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Same for solar, like as it gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, it's just gonna be possible to put it everywhere on everything all the time. And so you can see in the, you know, in the, in the, in the distant future, but our lifetimes, I think, uh, a society in which power is ubiquitous. And, yeah. and, and, and to coin a phrase, too cheap to meter. Yeah. Um, is that going to happen? 
I think, I think we'll always have a reason to pay for it. And we'll just, you know, appetite, as the cost goes down, appetite might go up. I mean, you look at other things, like the cost of lighting has dropped by a factor of 500 over the last century, right? And that's a combination of power getting cheaper, like the way that we produce lighting getting cheaper, and efficiency, LEDs. Uh, so will the cost of power drop? Uh, eventually it will. I think that what you're going to see is right now the grid investment is sapping up most of the reduction in cost of renewables. Um, and we, the, the cost differential of power across time and space is going to change. What I mean by that is like today, power costs do fluctuate by season um, and by location, but fossil fuel costs vary less. Uh, whereas in the future, what you're going to find is like, how do you power stuff in winter? especially in a place far away from the equator. So the power cost average across the year might be cheaper, but in January, like in the UK, in, in London, you get one-seventh as much power from solar panels in January as you do in June or July. So that means that the cost of power from solar, at least, is going to be ludicrously high in winter. And guess what? UK energy use or Germany's peaks in winter. So I think you might find much cheaper power in certain times and places, but not as much in northern latitudes in winter, and that's going to cause funky things in sort of our power pricing. That having been said, like, I think there's every reason to believe that in the long run, energy is going to be cheaper for people than it is today, certainly as a proportion of, of income. Yeah, I guess I just wonder if you ever can imagine it becoming cheap enough and ubiquitous enough that we get to something like elevated global standards of living and, and getting, fully, lug, fully aut autonomous luxury communism or whatever you call it? Maybe. I mean, we're, we're getting more elevated standards of living around the world today, right? People don't know this, but global inequality peaked in the 1970s and has been dropping since then. If you compare you know, countries around the world and not just within one country, uh, poverty has you know, dropped massively. So we, you know, the number of people on Earth that don't have electricity access has dropped materially in the last 10 or 20 years. Number of people without access to clean water and food has dropped a lot in China and India, less so in Africa. So we are gradually increasing global abundance. Are, are we going fast enough? No, but it's happening. And I think there's every reason to believe that it will continue to happen. So let's talk about fast enough then, because obviously the, the counterweight to fully automated luxury communism is, uh, climate dystopia. <clears throat> Who knows how those might balance out? What fun, what fun, we'll all find out. <laughs> it's good for science fiction. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it's clear, though, that even with all the good news these days and all the momentum behind clean energy and I think growing momentum, you could say, it looks pretty clear that we're not going to hit our 1.5 degree target that uh, we all agreed on in the UN, not at least through the replacement of fossil fuels with, with clean energy uh, alone. So, you know, I think that's, people say that a lot and then, and then you know, there's a sad trombone and everybody's sad for a while and then we move on, but like, it seems like we should, it seems like that's important and we should be like thinking about what that means, yeah. what to do with that information, what we should, you know, what we should do. Are there emergency, you know, like, like pull, pull, pull handle if, if emergency type things we should be doing when we think about avoiding 1.5 yeah. Uh, or trying to keep to 1.5 or compensating for not hitting for 1.5. So how do, you, how do you think about sort of, if you think of the energy world as kind of going the right direction but not fast enough, what do you do about the rise in temperature in the meantime? It, it's a great question. I'd just like to put some numbers around that. When you and I both sort of got into this field, you know, 2011, let's say, we thought the world was headed for four, five, or six degrees Celsius of warming. And that's like the difference between now and the middle of the last ice age. That is truly the stuff of nightmares. That is like agriculture would fail in various large parts of the world. Probably not an extinction level event, uh, but maybe the end of human society in certain ways. Like yes, really I never forget good. Kevin Anderson's quote, is four degrees is incompatible with organized global yeah. society. It ain't good, right? So the, the good news is we have very likely canceled that apocalypse. Like if you look at what's happened now, uh, just in the last 24 months, we had a raft of papers saying 
Uh, the most recent one says the most likely outcome, there's climate dice, there's probability distributions, there's lots of unknowns in this. But the most likely outcomes now are, I think the most recent paper said 2.1 and 2.4 degrees Celsius of warming. And so the good news is like we should all celebrate that for a while because that is a level of temperature that is actually compatible with the world overall growing richer, okay? Like that is, that is we've canceled, like it's no longer gonna be, what's the movie where you have like a new ice age come in, whatever, any, any of these. Day uh, after tomorrow. Day after tomorrow. We're not, we're not, we're probably not headed for that right now. So like, let's take a moment to like actually like be happy. And that, and that movie had an ice age that. literally coming like block by block. There were people running away from it. <laughs> that, that, that'd be really, really bad. Um, but the bad news is we have missed 1.5 degrees C. And I don't know how to say this any more clearly because there are people that will tell you that we might hit it. The odds of that are minuscule. You can still torture a model to get the model to, to, show, <laughs> to the, show us hitting it. The carbon budget, the remaining budget, the most recent papers like from uh, last month say that the carbon budget to have a 50-50 shot of staying below 1.5 C is about 250 gigatons, okay? We're emitting about 50 gigatons of carbon per year. So that's five years of emissions. Or if we smoothly went from 2022's numbers to zero in 10 years, by 2032, we'd have about a 50-50 chance of staying below 1.5. That ain't gonna happen, okay? Like, it's just not a thing. Now the good news is, to stay below two degrees C, it's about a trillion tons. So that's about 40 years of emissions, uh, so it's about yeah, a little over 20 years of emissions. If we had 40 years to reach zero, you have a 52 chance to take below two degrees C. That's a stretch, 2062, <laughs> but it's not impossible. It's a stretch. Yes. And 2.5 degrees C is more than two trillion tons. So that, if you like, smoothed out from today to net zero in 2100, you'd have a 50-50 chance. The models tell us of staying below 2.5 degrees C, and that is totally achievable. So that's. That's the good news. Okay, what's the bad news? So first, like at 1.5 degrees C, the world does not end. It doesn't end at 1.6 degrees C, uh, but every tenth of a degree matters. And right now, for instance, most recent papers say that every coral reef on Earth above 1.5 degrees C will experiencing bleaching events more rapidly than they can recover from. They won't all die on day one, but like they'll just enter a period of like permanent decline. Now the plan's gonna be fine. After the last mass extinction event, it took about four million years to recover biodiversity in the oceans. That ain't, that's nothing to the planet. But <laughs> it's forever for human civilization. So our, our children and their children will not live in a place of, of such abundance. Okay, so what can you do? Um, I started to say that well, there's three things we have to do on climate. Number one is build. That's a lot of what we just talked about. Getting out of the way of permitting, having more policies to build stuff, so on. Number two is help nature adapt. And I'm gonna say the things that are like my most provocative things, maybe you're not gonna like me after this, but I'll just, <laughs> just call it how I see it. There is no such thing as wilderness on planet Earth anymore. We have modified the climate such that if, you're, if it's a forest, if it's a coral reef, if it's a wetlands, it doesn't exist in the same climactic band that that natural, natural ecosystem evolved in. And so if you want to preserve those, we have to actively manage every so-called wild ecosystem on Earth, whether that's rainforests, or our forests in the Northwest, or in Canada, or in the tundra, or things like coral reefs. And there's ways we can do that, but we have to get off of this, this naturalistic fallacy of like, we should just leave nature alone. You leave nature alone, it's gonna die. Right? The only way to do this is, we, have to be, we know there's some coral species that do better in high temperatures and acidity. We can be, nobody wants to genetically engineer them, but you could be selectively breeding coral species for maximum survival rates uh, in high temperature and helping these coral reefs uh, adapt so that they can survive. So that's, that's one. And then the next one, which is the even more controversial one, is um, we've already geoengineered the planet. We just have. We've done it accidentally through carbon emissions and also done it by things like when people talk about solar radiation management, this is a scary kind of geoengineering, what we're talking about is you know, reflecting more sunlight into space. Cloud brightening uh, or injecting um, aerosols into the stratosphere to reflect a tiny bit of sunshine uh, back into space. Nobody wants to do that, okay? <laughs> but, but let's be clear, we're already doing that and we're, we're undoing it unintentionally. Today, uh, if you look at IPCC's numbers, all greenhouse gases account for about three watts per square meter of warming. That's human activity. The sulfur aerosols we're already emitting from ship fuels, from diesel engines, from coal plants, low altitude, they cause acid rain and other nasty stuff. That's about one watt per square meter of cooling 
We're talking about a solar shield with huge error bars, bigger error bars than, than uh, greenhouse gases. And guess what? We're undoing that. In 2000, the International Maritime Organization, new IMO regulations went in that reduced the sulfur content of ships. And that means that we're in for this bonus warming where we're undoing our solar shade uh, and we're gonna have more warming happening. You see it, you're gonna see from satellites, shipping lanes uh, having less reflection and more sunlight being captured. Yes, this is an irony that is not well understood in the public, I think, is that by cleaning up air pollution, we are pretty radically accelerating warming. Yeah. So James Hansen, and James is a little bit of a radical son. He's got a paper out, and he's really, really worried about unforeseen bonus warming as we cut these uh, sulfur aerosols. So should we just, does that mean we just like start injecting some into the stratosphere? No. Uh, what we ought to do is some science. So to last year, before the IRA, the world spent about $1.1 trillion on climate tech. 1.4 if you ask the IEA. That's, you know, one times 10 to the ninth. The total budget for all science into solar radiation management has been about $10 million, right? Like one times 10 to the, the, the seventh, right? Sorry, I think I've got a, a factor of three off there. But uh, yeah, sorry, 10 to the 12th versus 10 to the seventh. So that's one 100,000th as much we spend on just doing like computer modeling and small experiments. And so I'm a modest man. I don't think we should spend a lot of money on this, but let's like spend a billion dollars a year. That's nothing. Americans spend $4 billion a year on shampoo. So a billion dollars is not much. It ain't, it's like chump change. A billion dollars in climate gets you nothing. But let's spend like a small amount, a billion dollars a year, on actually doing the science. Better computer models, more compute time, more funding for scientists, uh, platforms that have sensors for the next volcanic eruption happens, it sends stratospheric aerosols up, we can send LIDAR and spectrography and so on through them and see what happens. And some small controlled experiments, tiny ones, to actually see how this works, just to know, do we have this tool in our toolbox so that we could deploy it if the Arctic starts to warm uh, exceptionally fast, we have uncontrolled methane release. And if we're not doing that, I think that's criminal, and that is the, the single biggest uh, problem that we have in climate tech, the single biggest omission that we have in our climate plans today. So when I think about those things, like... No one's thrown a tomato at me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's still chewing on it. Um, when, I th when I think about these things, you know, like one of the things I've learned over the course of my career is that lots of ideas sound good <laughs> if you can sort of stipulate a rational humanity to do them. Uh, but it turns out that's a large stipulation yeah <laughs> and in fact uh we don't have one of those and in fact we screw everything up so i'm just trying to imagine humanity as we currently know it with our current leaders and our current institutions trying to manage every <clears throat> global ecosystem and it, my mind turns to various horrors and it, it could be horrific but let's bear in mind we're just doing it now on accident so we had this, like, this status quo bias of like, oh, as long as it's accidental, it's fine for us to play God. But, you know, like, God forbid that we start, like, doing it with a plan. Um, and some of these things, like solar radiation management, are so cheap that, you know, Bill Gates could afford to just do it on his own. He's not going to. Uh, but if, if we don't, like, do the science, then somebody's going to do it without having the data on what the effects are. So I think that's more irresponsible than, than actually understanding it. Yeah, I think it's in uh, um, um, the book, The Deluge, which uh, uh, maybe some of you guys have read. I did a pod on it uh, uh, a while back. I don't know if you've read it. You, you really should. You would yeah. love it. It's, it's, a, it's an effort to sort of play out climate politics for the next 40 years. And one of the chapters of that book is about India, um, rogue solar, manage, <laughs> solar yeah. managing and, it, and, it, and I, it leading to uh, causing a war, basically, like a, an invasion. And Kim Stanley Robinson had a plot like that in uh, Ministry of the Future as well. Like it's, it's something that, that any small country basically could afford to do. Yeah, crazy. Okay, um, I quasi-deliberately left about 10 minutes for uh, Q&A here, an, a, a, a spontaneous Q&A. So if anyone has questions for uh, Mez, please say so. Please raise your hand. I have a question. So you mentioned 
you talked about the deep stuff with, you know, we're not likely to meet the limit to 1.5 and all that. I've been thinking a lot about options to phase out fossil fuel infrastructure potentially early to get rid of locked in emissions, which is causing a significant chunk of that problem. So this could be a range of different options from early coal, retiring coal plants early to creative options to get people off the this sort of EVs that I don't really want to bring up here. But um, what is what are your thoughts on that area in particular in terms of how much you can at least make a difference towards limited damage overall? Um, yeah, I think yeah. it's a great question. I think there are multiple things we could do. Like one of the most successful environmental Wait, Let policies. me just, just for, for listeners yeah. at home, the question is, is about what, if anything, we can do about restricting and cutting off supply early to try to hit these targets that we're currently on, on course to miss. Yeah, I would say overall, I'm, I'm less of a cut off supply person because so often, if you cut off supply in one place, somebody else produces it and routes around it, right? If you like, Shell sold all of their oil fields in the Permian, guess what? They sold them to Exxon or somebody who just produces the oil anyway. So like divestment is also, it's a hard sell to me. That having been said, uh, that we should try many things. And so some of the most successful policies uh, have been policies that worked with local communities. The Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign, funded by Mike Bloomberg, you know, worked with local communities to shut down coal plants early and to find jobs for the people that worked in coal mines, working in these coal plants, uh, replace them off with natural gas, with, uh, with renewables and so on, sometimes. Wildly successful, before it was cool, by the way. Yeah. Shout out to Sierra Club. Yeah, and so I think you can have creative stuff, but as, but as Justin was saying on the previous panel, like, you've gotta have buy-in uh, from the community, uh, from other stakeholders, to get that sort of model built, I think. What would you say, if I can, uh, inject here, what would you say to someone who said, if you are willing to contemplate something as extreme as humans managing all global ecosystems and managing the atmosphere with SRM, it seems like, it seems like the chances of those screwing up are high and it would be worth a lot to, to avoid them. What do you think about Malm's argument for eco-terrorism? Ooh, um, I don't advocate violence. Uh, I think, look, I mean, I think that as a science fiction writer, terrorism is very exciting because you can like, you can write a plot, a thriller plot around it. It's hard to write a thriller plot around climate in general. Um, but like in reality, would it work or would it have you know, negative effects or blowback? I really don't know. But one of the reasons to do the research on things like SRM is to reduce the need for someone to engage in eco-terrorism. <laughs> um, and so I think that's, that's worth thinking about. Oh yeah, you have questions. Hi, big fan of the podcast, I absolutely adore it. Um, my name's Ben Riley. Uh, we, we've gone beyond just simply the energy transition. My, my question um, is related to that, which is the role of negative emissions and how do you feel about uh, what various forms and what role it has to play? Yeah. So again, I'm somebody who's a believer in let's build more tools than we think we might need, and I'm a big tent person. Like, I'm dubious on nuclear fission, but I'm like, more power to it. Let's invest in it, let's change the NRC, make it easier to build stuff, and so on. That's more or less how I feel about CDR, too. So personally, my bet is, you know, permanent carbon removal is just too expensive. Uh, to cut temperatures by about a tenth of a degree C, you've got to cut carbon emissions by you know, 100 billion to 200 billion tons. And so if you're talking about $100 a ton carbon removal, you're talking about 10 or 20 trillion dollars. And that's, that's real money. And that's if you get to 100 <laughs> bucks a ton. So personally, like, I'm really excited that, that Stripe and Microsoft and Google are committing billions of dollars to carbon removal advanced purchases. Uh, you know, they, they've learned a lot from learning rates and so on. That's, that's really their, that's modeling up that off what we learned in solar. Uh, and I think more power to them. But I, I'm not making any bets in that sector uh, because I just don't see, like if you tell me that carbon removal could get down to like $10 a ton or $5 a ton, I think it might be a big part of the, of the solution. But at 100 bucks a ton or 50 bucks a ton, 
I just don't think the world, I think there will be multi-billion dollar markets, you'll have some people make a lot of money, some venture capitalists will do well, some startups will do well, and it won't move the needle, is my personal bet. But again, I'd love to be wrong. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, we're, we're going to have to do what Nick says. So, David and Mez, you've both expressed sentiment that we have sight lines to decarbonizing most, essentially, of the economy, and that clean energy is cheap, and it's getting cheaper, and that it's going to you know, outcompete fossil fuels in a lot of applications. But I'm curious about the possibility uh, and what you see as the potential that we get most of the way there, and then we get to the really hard parts, and things kind of stall out in terms of the political will to accept the high cost of getting to a completely decarbonized future, which we need to get to to actually halt global warming. Because although clean energy is cheaper probably for a lot of applications, it's questionable that an economy that uses both, that uses exclusively clean energy is gonna be cheaper than one that uses clean energy and also has the option to use fossil fuels where they're you know, most cost effective. So yeah. curious for your thoughts on that. You want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting conceptual question about how you think about the transition, whether it is like a boulder rolling down a hill, gaining momentum and momentum, momentum, such that it will just crush and go right through the last bits, or whether it's, you know, you're, you're, you're eating the fruit off the tree that's lowest and you have to climb higher and higher and it gets harder and harder and harder and harder. And I think there's a little bit of both, but I'm still yeah. curious what you have to think. I, I think of it as we're, we're on an S curve, right? And we, it's like renewables, let's say just in power, solar and wind are 13% of global power generation. They are entering the decade where they might have the fastest growth, and we're going to see the growth accelerate. But at some point, they do hit these headwinds of, you know, as Jesse has done and, and you've done, these, like, they cannibalize themselves, they suppress prices at the hours that they're operating with the problem of winter. And so you get you to do, more difficult land. You get to more difficult land for sure. And so you do hit this challenge, whether it's at 60%, 70%, 80%, where it gets harder and harder. And so I do think, you know, most models, most like, you know, uh, m models of decarbonization assume a curve that looks like this. We have the, yeah. the fastest reductions early, and then it kind of goes like this. And I think that, um, we're going to see something that's much more of like an S-curve, where it's going to take a while to hit the peak, and then renewable like emissions are going to drop from some sectors really fast, and then the, t the last bit is going to be really hard and really slow. Um, but while everyone's obsessed with hitting net zero, like if we get to uh, 10 billion tons a year by 2100, that's actually still compatible with canceling the apocalypse. So I, I, I worry more. That's, you know, this is to steal a, 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 a movie, memorable movie <laughs> quote. Um, I worry more about the next 20, 30, 40, 50% than I do about the last 20% right now. Although I do think we should invest in more technologies to try to have, you know, a head run or a, a head start on those sectors now than we need. And, and, and just one other consideration to throw in there is that as the carbon lobby shrinks, policies to reduce carbon become easier to pass. So when you're targeting a smaller part of the economy, it's a little politically easier, I think, than it was when you're saying everybody reduce everything. Yeah. Hi. Um, so under the umbrella of hot trends and climate tech, I'm curious about grid enhancing technologies specifically, um, both on the transmission and the distribution system. I'm curious if there are any things that either of you are particularly excited about? Mm. Um, and what do you think some of the limitations or challenges are to adopting those technologies and how do we overcome them? So, small question. <laughs> yeah. You want to go first, go ahead. Sure, yeah, and I think it's fascinating. I think like the grid, you know, I talked about permitting and long range transmission, but interconnection queues and distribution are, you know, a, a more pressing problem. Uh, it's a, a problem for like hooking up your renewables to the grid at all. There are problems for things like, you know, Justin was talking about how do you build a, an EV truck charging depot. You know, if you want a system of high speed chargers for electric semis, that's like a tens of megawatts uh, power drop. That's like a small town. So, so building that is, is really hard and the grid is not used to, to working fast. Um, I'm a big fan of software control of, uh, of power generation and consumption. There's lots of startups that are doing interesting things to make more efficient use of the grid. 
Uh, storage at the grid edge, I think, can do a lot to make better use of the current system. Um, and you have some other crazy ideas. Uh, for instance, uh, a friend of mine uh, did her dissertation on taking high voltage AC transmission corridors, assume that you can't build more transmission as a permitting, but upgrading the power electronics on current uh, corridors to, from AC to DC, and you could get, uh, this is Liza Groen, uh, you could get triple or quadruple the power on this existing rights of way. So I think there's, there's solutions like that that are probably still underinvested in, or there's veer, it's like a superconducting tape you apply to, I don't know if that'll ever work, but that's, that one would be cool. You can apply it to current transmission lines and again, massively increase the power on them. So I think there's, a, there's room for a lot of creative solutions. Yeah, I, I don't think people really under, get that on a lot of these big long distance transmission lines, a lot of our big transmission lines, they run at like 30% capacity, like 30, 40% capacity, just because we need a big buffer because we don't know in real time what's happening on that line. So it's all, I mean, it, this gets to a larger theme, which I just was mentioning on a, on a podcast earlier, which is I don't think people appreciate, especially people who grew up around the internet and, and people who view sort of information as sort of like modular and transmissible everywhere and everything, people think of the grid that same way, but I think people would be shocked to hear how much of the grid operates by people turning knobs and making phone calls to other people like, hey, you should probably use less power over there. Like it's very, it's weirdly primitive how we run our grid now. And that's not a technology problem. There's all kinds of grid enhancing technology. There's all kinds of ways to get a lot more out of the existing grid. And just generally moving towards digitizing the grid, to me, the barriers there are almost 100% socio-political. It's almost 100% utilities, which is, you know, you pull any string in this mess long enough and you end up back in utilities. It's utilities uh, not being, you know, on top of things. Uh, so I think that's, you know, on the one hand, that's very frustrating, but on the other hand, I think that could change quickly if we ever get utilities in, in hand. I don't know how to and do fix that. Their, but fix their incentive model and yeah. Yes, I know, change the, yeah, we don't have to get into the whole utility mess, but like, yeah, that's 100% that's, that's about just procedures and, and regulations and things like that more than technology, I think. What, are we done? I think that's, that was the execution, that was the death sentence. I think that. we're done. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Thank you all. Oh, yes. Okay. So we're done, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks. Give money to Canary. Thanks, David. Yeah. Okay. Huge thanks to David and Ramez for being with us tonight. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for coming and joining us tonight. This has been so great to have you here. Um, if you want to keep up with what Canary Media is doing, find out about our future events, future events in Seattle or elsewhere, um, subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, there's a QR code by the door. You could do that on your way out or go to canarymedia.com and sign up. And again, if you appreciate what we're doing in these kinds of events, uh, consider making a donation to Canary. They're tax deductible and um, we appreciate all of it. So thank you so much. And for subscribe out to Volts. And subscribe and subscribe to Volts. <laughs>